All right, so first of all, um, I felt like I won the speaker's lottery because I got to go first, which for speakers means that you get to rest the whole time. But it also means that there's no chance that someone who's uh, going to rock the house is going to go in front of you. <laughs> How did that happen? Was that, let's have one more. I want to have one more for that. Was that awesome? <laughs> and the other thing I'd like to do before I get started is uh, thank again the sponsors who, pin, who paid money, actual cash money, so we could have this, and also the organizers. It's... Now that, I'm now that I'm fortunate enough to travel around and go to more than one conference a year, uh, I can tell you that we're, we're an amazing community and part of the community is built at events like this. And people put real money down and spend many hours to make it happen so that we can be here together. So I, and I, I actually totally suck at both those. Well, I'm pretty good at giving money, but I'm bad at organization. So I'm deeply appreciative of the people who put that effort together. So thank you all again. All right, so now the talk. Over. The talk, we're on. So I'm here today to tell your future. I know your future. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about your past. That is, it'll be your past if you're, uh, like me, of European descent. If you're from further east, if you're from Korea or Japan or China, your story's a little different. If you're from anywhere in the Americas, it's different still. But all the stories do converge before we get to today. And so uh, it eventually will become your story. And today's story starts with a scroll. Scrolls were first invented perhaps 7,000 years ago. And they certainly existed in ancient Egypt by 3,000 BCE. Now, if you're not familiar with that terminology, BCE is the new, it stands for before common era. It's the new language for BC. So instead of BC, AD, they now say before common era, common era. <clears throat> I'm likely to get that wrong. And I find the whole thing kind of confusing. So from now on, I'm just going to use negative numbers. So. <laughs> Scrolls. We had scrolls in ancient Egypt in minus 3,000. So this is, this is ink or paint written with reeds or rolled up metal tubes on papyrus, which is a plant from, the, from along the banks of the River Nile. Here's a close-up of the writing. You can see that there's not much in the way of spaces or punctuation. It's kind of hard to tell the words apart, but it doesn't really matter because there aren't many writers and there aren't many readers, and they have some bargain that they use to figure all this out. So scrolls were the latest in technology from minus 3,000 right up until around the year zero, at which time the Romans got involved and they started, they created something called a codex. Now a codex is just a book. It's a thing with leaves, pages, that's bound on one end. Um, the codex has some real advantages over the scroll. You can, uh, it has, it's random access. You can easily replace any damaged bit. And you can read and write at the same time. This codex is made of uh, thin pieces of wood covered with wax that that person scratches on with a stylus. So it's sort of a Roman etch-a-sketch. It's, it's erasable. Um, it's a short-term record. And here's another uh, painting. This, is, this painting is from 692. Um, starting with the Romans, most writing started, began to be done by monks in uh, scriptoriums of monasteries. And as far as I can tell, a scriptorium is kind of a co-working space for writing. Except everything they use, all the materials are incredibly flammable, and the scriptorium is next to the library. So the heat is never on. And if you look at these old writings by the monks, they, would, they like us, uh, when they're unhappy, they would sneak subversive comments into the margins. And so these old books have things like, my feet are cold, my hand is cramped, I hate my job, <laughs> written, written in the margins of some of the documents they produced. Um, monks are religious people, and so of course, mostly what they write about is religious things. Here's an example. This is Latin, it's from a Psalter, which is a part of the biblical book of Psalms. It's from around 1300. So now you can see real differences in this writing. It has spaces and punctuation, and the sentences and the paragraphs begin with a different form of the letter. This, this looks like a real font, and it actually has a name. This is Gothic liturgical hand. And this, this document was written by Quill on parchment. So quills, people started using quills. The monks started using quills around 600. The very best quill for a right-handed writer comes from the left primary wing feather of a goose. And a big book like the Complete Bible takes about five years to write. 
And you can uh, completely go through a quill in a week. So you're, <laughs> you're going to need a lot of geese. And parchment, what they're writing on, is made from sheepskin. And a big book is going to take hundreds of sheep. And yeah, you guessed it. You're, you're going to need a lot of sheep. And really high quality parchment is called vellum. It's beautiful, it's easy to work with, it's easy to erase, it's the very best writing surface. And it's made from the skin of baby sheep. And all the pictures broke my heart. <laughs> so there will be no illustration of vellum. <laughs> Here's another example. This is, uh, I don't quite know how to pronounce this. It's an either antiphonal or antiphonal. It's uh, 13th century sheep music. And it's, it's just beautiful. Like these are people who really cared about their craft. And so from their start in zero, over the next 600 years, codexes gradually replaced scrolls. And from 600 on into the 1400s, books are written on parchment by hand using quills. And by 1407, monks are producing uh, things that look like this. This is a Bible from 1407. But in the next 40 years, just 40 odd years later, by around 1450, there's a dramatic change. So at this time in Europe, there's a bunch of objects are around that are common enough so that they're under everyone's eye. And one of them is the wine press. Now, the way the wine press works is there's a, this gives me a chance to use my laser pointer, which we love. So it's got this handle at the top that's connected to a thing that's actually a screw. And on the bottom of it, there's a lid that fits inside this barrel. And so if you screw it all the way up, you can fill the barrel with grapes and then screw it down and press the juice out. Uh, less romantic, probably, but far more efficient than using your feet. And, they, and also, another thing that everybody can see are coins. Now, these are Roman coins from, uh, they were punched out between 75 and 79. That's, of course, 0075 and 0079. Um, to make a coin, you need a die. And then what a die is an any. There's a die of the front and a die of the back. And it's an any of that shape. Someone carves it. And you, make a, you take a coin blank, you heat it up, soften it, and you make a little sandwich, die, blank, die, and you hit it with a hammer. And the blank deforms into the die, and now you have a coin. Now, the problem with dies is that they wear out really fast. You whack them over and over again. And people want all the coins to look alike. They want all the coins to seem identical. And so right away, they figured out a problem. They solved the problem of dies wearing out by making something they call a punch. And a punch looks just like a coin. A punch is a rod of metal where one rod has the front of the coin and one rod has the back. And it looks just like the coin. So you can use the punch to make a die. And then you can use the dies to make coins until they wear out, at which point you can throw those dies away and make a new one from a punch that you've just used one time. So this idea of transferring shapes around via punch and die on metal is really common. Everybody in Europe knows how coins are made. And also, at, around this time, about 1450, something becomes common that arrived from China within the last 150 years, and it's paper. Now, relative to parchment, paper is not so great. It's fragile, you can't erase it, you can't reuse it, it's easy to destroy. But you can make it from rags and hemp, plant fibers. And it's, it's, it's expensive, but it's not as expensive as sheep. And so in uh, 1430 in Mainz, Germany, all these things are under the eye of this man, Johannes Gutenberg. He was a blacksmith and a goldsmith, and, and eventually he's the inventor of the modern printing press. Now, he combines these things into a grand idea for something he calls an automatic writing machine. And building it took the rest of his life. It left him in serious legal trouble. It drove him into bankruptcy. It made other people rich, and it changed the world. It took him many years to make it work. He wanted to print books. But like all of us, what he did was he spent many years shaving yaks. And the biggest yak he had to shave was making this. This is called a sort. And you can see that it looks kind of like a coin punch. It's got a surface on it. If you ink that surface and then press it onto a sheet of paper, it will faithfully transfer that image. But it's different from a coin punch in that it has little shapes along the shaft. And, and the, those, those shapes are important. And you're going to need a ton of sorts. You need a lot of sorts. You need every letter and every font and every size. And they wear out really fast. And when you make new ones, they got to be right. The face has to be right, and the shaft has to be right. So the printing press is not going to work until Gutenberg figures out a way to reliably duplicate sorts. And he spends many, many, many years perfecting this process, and he borrows money the whole time. And the Indians are doing this. The thing on the left 
is a, starts out as a block of soft metal and someone carves that letter into it. It looks like a punch. They take the letter, they take it and they temper it, they harden it, and then they take another block of soft metal and they punch this uh, negative into this other piece which is called the, mat the matrix. Now, remember that the sort, the real sort that they're going to use to print has stuff along its shaft and they make it using this thing which is called a hand mold. Now you can look at that all you want, but I defy you to figure out how it works. <laughs> Here's what I can tell you about it, alright? This is the whole thing assembled. This is the left half and the right half. So the B and C are an explosion of A. The way it works is you take that matrix and you slide it in the bottom here and then you pour hot lead in the top. And something about whatever's inside this hand mold is what makes the little notches on the shaft. And so it takes him a long time to get this right. But once, once Gutenberg can do this, after many years, he creates this machine. And you can see all those parts. Here's the wine press. And then this is a form of sorts. You can see that if you ink that form, lay a sheet of paper on it, flip this lid down, and then pull that lever, you can create one side of one page of a book. Once you get the type set up, an experienced team can print 200 pages an hour. One day we were hand copying pages, and on the next we had the printing press. Now Gutenberg printed between 160 and 185 Bibles, about a quarter of them on vellum and the rest on paper. This Bible is 1,300 pages long and was completed sometime between March and November of 1455, right before Gutenberg went bankrupt and lost the rights to the printing press. And so he vanishes from this story. Gutenberg's gone now, but his invention remains. It dramatically speeds up printing. All kinds of new works begin to get written. And the primary cost of printing is now in the setting of type. Before you can print a page, you have to collect all the type you need in every font and every size, and you have to assemble them correctly on the page. And it's a ton of type. Drawers and drawers of it. And over the next 400 years, some print shop patterns emerge. People didn't need as many of that special form of letter that starts uh, the sentence or a paragraph. And it became, and by convention, they started storing them in the upper cases. It's truly amazing, isn't it? And all those, all that smaller form where they need many, many, many more of those, they would store them in the lower cases. And it was completely unambiguous. You could tell someone, go get me the lower case E in this font and this size, and they would know exactly what you meant. When laying out a book, you usually didn't have enough type to lay out a whole book. And so you had to decide in advance how many copies you expected to sell. And you would lay out a series of pages and print that many copies of, you know, however many copies you expected to sell of that set of pages. And then you would iterate. You'd break down that type and set up more type and break down that type. And, and it wasn't uncommon to realize somewhere deep into laying out pages that you had miscalculated how many sorts you had. And you run out of a letter. You would be out of sorts. <laughs> Which indeed, indeed you were. Um, and so, the problem of having to reset type, break down and reset type, reset type that you had already set in the past was solved in 1725 by a man named William Ged. He, made, he started making paper mache impressions of a form of setting, set, set type. And then he could use that paper mache to cast a metal sheet, and then he could use that sheet to reset, uh, to reprint new type. Stereotyping had costs. Then as now, right? But, and so it was the exception. They didn't always stereotype print that they'd set. Um, in uh, 1850, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, and he was, always a, he was already a famous author. So his publishers thought that it was going to be a runaway bestseller, and so they set all the type. They didn't, they didn't stereotype it. They set all the type, and they printed 2,500 copies of The Scarlet Letter, and then it sold out in two months. And then they reset all the type by hand, and they printed a bunch more, and it sold out in four months. And then they reset all the type by hand again a third time, and at that point, they finally broke down and stereotyped it. So that, that, I, that word, our word stereotype, comes, comes directly from printing. And so now, with the advent of the printing press, the, the number of copies of printed books in Europe explodes. And this chart, this chart is logarithmic. It starts out at 10,000, and that top number is a billion. 
And every letter on every page of every book was set by hand. And unlike books, newspapers set up and break down type every day. And in the middle of the 19th century, there was no newspaper in the world that was more than eight pages long. And by the 1870s, many people were working on this problem, the problem of automating the setting of type. And by 1884, after eight years of work, this man, I have no idea how to pronounce his name, Otmar, Otmar, he's German. Help me if you can, doesn't matter. Gutenberg, Mergenthal, Mergenthaler. He solved this problem of automating the setting of type. So he's a watchmaker's apprentice in Germany, moves to Washington, D.C., and eventually to Baltimore. And his machine revolves around something he simply calls a matrix. Here it is. You can see it looks a lot like Gutenberg's matrix. There's the letter W in set. And you can see, you can imagine if you stack a bunch of matrices, or mats as they call them, side by side, that you could pour hot lead into them, and you can dynamically produce a line of type. Now, you need, not, you need a lot of mats. You still need a bunch of mats, but you need upper and lower case in every letter and every font and size. But since the machine ca basically dynamically creates sorts, it casts type a line at a time, you don't need nearly as many copies of mats as hand setters of type needed copies of sorts. And so this little brass thing, they're about this big. This thing is the central piece in this machine. And the basic parts of this machine are the keyboard, the magazine, the mold wheel and the melting pot, and then this thing up here they call the distributor. And so here's how it works. The, the mats are stacked up in the magazine. And when you press a letter on the keyboard, they fall down through one of these chutes and a symbol in this line. I have a close-up of that. So here you can see they're falling down, and those are the mats in line. Now, spaces aren't mats. They're, these, uh, the, they're called space bands. They're actually shims. You can see they're thicker at the bottom than they are at the top. And so once the spaces get put in there, it moves here in this piece that's labeled number five here. It pushes up on those shims, and it spreads the line out till it hits the stops. And that's how they justified lines of type. Once it gets justified, they move it over and stick it on the mold wheel. And then this plunger presses down into a vat of molten lead, I kid you not, and presses it up this little chute and into that slot. So then it presses against the matrices. And in this way, one at, a time, one at a time, the machine produces lines of type. Now, all that's left is for the mats to get back up where they started from. And you probably couldn't tell in the earlier picture, but these little teethy things on the top of the matrices, matrices, they're not all the same. Some of the teeth are missing. And so this is uh, like a binary code. And so this thing gets carried back up to the top of the machine, and it hangs on this groove bar. And the screws turn, and they push the mat down to a place where it will fall off back into the slot that goes with the key that you can press to use that mat. Believe it or don't, I have a demo. Let's now review the entire procedure at a glance. The manipulation of the keys releases the mats from in the magazine. They drop between the assembly entrance partition and are delivered to assembling elevator to form the line. The finished line is sent on to the caster. The mold and the metal pot advance, and the plunger makes the cast. The pot and the mold withdraw. Then the first elevator rises to transfer the mat to the second elevator bar. At the same time, the slug, trimmed at the base and sides, is ejected into the galley. The mats go to the distributor. Moved by the helicoidal screws, they run along the length of the distributor bars so that, with the procedure already noted, they fall into the respective channels of the magazine, ready for use in succeeding lines. Thomas Edison called the linotype machine the eighth wonder of the world. Book publishers and newspapers bought linotype machines as fast as they could get their hands on them. And newspapers went from eight to 48 pages practically overnight. There was an explosion of printed material. Suddenly we, suddenly we were setting type in lines per minute instead of minutes per line. This is, this is the composing room of the New York Times in uh, 1942. And here's a 1943 picture of the Dallas Morning News. Now, this room is a workplace safety nightmare. <laughs> 
there's hot lead, there's parts that won't stop moving no matter what you do. It's incredibly noisy. This is one of the few occupations in the world where they actively sought, deaf, sought out deaf people. If you're gonna work in the composing room, it's best that you already have a hearing loss. <laughs> and the machines are incredibly hard to operate, and mostly uh, the practitioners of this art teach each other one by one. There's no real way to learn this except on the job, and the people who are good at it are proud of their craft, and they teach the apprentices as they come in. This is a man, this is also at the Dallas Morning News, a man doing manual spell check. So once the lines of type go, they fall in the galley, there's a set of type, it goes out in these trays to what they call the makeup men. And then from there they go to someone who uh, reads them upside down and backwards and assembles a page. You know, say it's, this is a sports page. Um, once the page gets set, laid out in the form, the type has to be leveled across the top so that uh, printing will be even, and so it goes out to this guy who has this block and you can't really see it, but he's wanging on the type with a mallet, trying to smooth out the top of that. So this is way, way, way faster than hand setting individual pieces of type, but it's still very labor intensive. First of all, the fonts for headings are a big type. So that won't, you can't do that on the line of type machine. They still use foundation type to set it. And then someone has to go out and lay all the bits out. They gotta put it everywhere it goes, arrange it, tidy it up. They're, they're out there, you can drop pieces. So annoying. And then it's a real pain to fix a typo. You can never complain about CSS again. <laughs> So the linotype is responsible for a new explosion of printed material. We, ha we now have new content, but more importantly than that, we have a new transparency of information. It, this made it possible for newspapers to print everything they could find out every day. So there's this incredible, incredible boost in uh, the production of books and magazines. Uh, the cost of education goes down. Literacy skyrockets. Print is now affordable and ubiquitous. And by 1928, the line of type machine was the primary typesetting machine in the world. Information is power, and the line of type machine made it available to everyone. But as with all of these arcs in technology, the reign of the line of type machine ended as quickly as it began. By the mid-1960s, it was replaced by the computer. And I remember when this happened. I grew up in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and my dad worked for the local paper. He was officially a member of the printer's union, and he could operate a linotype machine if, under duress. But he was really a mechanic. It was his job to keep the linotype machines, the, the hot, dirty, dangerous, noisy linotype machines and presses running. There was an interesting ethic about the paper. No matter what disaster occurred, they put a newspaper out every day. Some days it wasn't very big, but it was a matter of extreme pride for them to get a paper out every day. When it was the only website that was, they never went down. My dad wore black clothes to work because it was impossible to get any other color clean. And his hands were always beat up. They were nicked and dinged and burnt. And he had this ground in grease and ink that no amount of lava soap could get off. And in my childhood in the 1960s, he would sometimes come home with mats in his pockets. But then, at that time, the, the era of hot type, as they called it, is ending. It's being replaced by this thing that they called cold type by computers. And he studied electronics in a little room in our basement during that era. And I remember this because he had an oscilloscope. And that was so cool. I really wanted to know how it worked. He, so he played with his oscilloscope and he was gone in the evenings for almost a year while he studied electronics. I also noticed it because after, after this period, his clothes gradually got replaced by tans and greens and grays. And then one day I noticed, I was sitting in his lap holding his hands and I noticed that his hands were pink and clean. He swam across the transition from hot to cold type and he spent many more years in the newspaper business. But as with scribes and setters of hand type, and then, and then linotype operators, many of his colleagues did not. All right, so now, 
against the backdrop of 5,000 years of the creation of content and the control of information, it's time for your fortune. And I want you to brace yourself because some of it's hard. Okay? So here we go. Everything will change. Everything. And the first thing is that you're going to die. And everyone you know will die. Your parents, your grandparents, everyone. Some will die in quiet peace after a long life well lived. But others will not be so lucky, and their end will come in confusion and pain and with regrets. Others will die too soon, before their time of accident or terrible disease or by their own hands. And they will leave you alone in grief and anger and guilt. And regardless of how they go, you will see them pass. And as the generations in front of you disappear one by one, you will feel yourself taking that giant step forward in the mortality line. I know this to be your future because it's my past. These things will come to be. And along the way, your body will fail you. Your eyes will weaken. You'll become unable to read street signs in unfamiliar places at night or menus in dimly lit restaurants. You'll become increasingly dependent upon and grateful for your GPS and that little flashlight in your cell phone. You'll have surgery on one or more joints. You'll develop low back trouble and a repetitive motion injury. Too many years of sitting in a keyboard typing, typing, typing will eventually freeze you into place. Yeah, all of these things have happened to me. And not only will your family change and your body change, but your work will change. I got my first programming job in the spring of 1978, three short months before the New York Times last set, last set a newspaper using a linotype machine. The first web browser, Mosaic, appeared 15 years later in June of 1993, and Ruby 0.95 was released on December 21st, 1995. Now, a mere 20 years later, after the internet, 20 years later after the first browser, the internet is at the center of our lives. We live inside this bubble, so it's hard to remember, but the job you have today appeared as suddenly as that of a linotype operator. In the 60s and 70s, when photo typesetting arrived, these machines became worthless overnight. The cheapest way to dispose of them, newspapers got rid of them by throwing them out upper story windows into parking lots and having them hauled off for scrap. So there you go, that's your future. <laughs> it doesn't involve an unexpected inheritance or a tall, dark stranger. Those, unfortunately, are edge cases. This is your real fortune. It's the one you share in common with everyone in this room. You can think of it as being on the happy path of the app of your life. And I admit it sounds bad. Death, decay, and obsolescence. Mm. What's not to like? But here's the deal. In the arc of your life, this is the happy path. These are the things you can depend upon. They're the abstraction. This is the meta layer that stands above everything else. If your life really were an app, you wouldn't ignore the inevitable. You'd be writing code for this right now. Accepting the truth of this fortune makes it clear what's important. The MVPs of the only app that matters are health, happiness, and the world we leave our children. And I want you to start working on this app right now. There's some low-hanging fruit. Because I'm standing down here now, I'm going to give you some advice. Happiness. Live as if you know you'll die. Do real things. Tell everyone you love them today. You might consider getting a little dog. <laughs> Health. OK, you don't have to do anything dangerous, but do something. It's a rear guard action. Believe me, I know. But go down fighting. Take breaks. Get an ergonomic keyboard. Stand up some while you work. Get some exercise. Get a bike if you want. Take walks. Go to the gym. 
You cannot make up tomorrow for not working out today. And believe me, you're going to want your body later. So there are parts of this app that you can work on by yourself, but some parts of the app are better for us to work on together as a community. Our community is important, and your place in it matters. It goes without saying that you, contribute to open, you can contribute to open source, or you can also you can teach if that suits you. Showing up in small ways makes a big difference. It's still mourning in our community, and every way, that, every way in which you stand up casts a very long shadow. So we can do things for ourselves, and we can do things for our tech community, but we're also uniquely qualified to do things for others. We're bigger than Rails, and we're bigger than Ruby. We're members of the tribe of information, and our lineage is that scribes and typesetters and linotype operators, from scrolls through codexes all the way through to composing rooms, we carry the mantle of the open sourcers of information. I feel doubly a member of this tribe, since not only do I do this work, but I was raised by a man who came home with mats in his pockets and ink in his hands. My dad's now 80, and he happily works four days a week. Two of them at Enterprise Rental Car, yes. He's the man who picks you up. <laughs> and two at the local food bank, where he mows the lawn and does the books and stocks the shelves and gets temporary loans for people where they, whose electricity has been cut off, and he tries to make sure that people don't go hungry. And despite his efforts, they do. I would not presume to say that you have an obligation to something bigger than yourself. But he feels one, and I inherited it from him. Your schools need help. Your neighborhoods need help. If you want to, you can pitch in literally. I love Habitat for Humanity. They build houses. I am not a bit religious, but I love this mission. We all want to belong, and we want to change the world. And Habitat lets you do both these things while working with dangerous tools. <laughs> I kid you not, once at a Habitat build, they let me drive the Bobcat. <laughs> if you're not the nail-banging, cheat rock hanging type, I can tell you from personal experience that Habitat's volunteer management software sucks. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make a sweeping generalization, which I hope you will not tweet. <laughs> For every one of these volunteer organizations, all of the software that they use to manage them, if we didn't write it, it sucks. Everywhere I look, there's something that needs doing. And I can tell you there is deep, deep satisfaction in doing it. It's an axiom among cyclists that either there's a headwind or you're having a good day. And I always, I'm always tempted to claim a fast, wind-assisted ride as my own accomplishment, as if I really am that strong and I did it all myself. But I can't forget that if my doppelganger, little Sandy Me, were out, on the same day, at the same time, under the same conditions, but riding in the opposite direction, that she would work just as hard, but accomplish far less. We are here because we have done the work. I know that. We got into this tribe by dint of our own efforts and because of our care for our craft. But we have also been blown here by the twin tailwinds of chance and change. We deserve our successes. There's no doubt that we have earned them, but there's a way in which we all got here because we are lucky enough to have the wind at our backs. Having looked at the past, we can predict the future, change. And by an accident of timing, we stand at the vortex of that change, at the intersection of information and technology. Unlike many others, we are lucky enough to have choices. And the things we choose now will create the world everyone sees next. I challenge you, choose something big.